my name is Kamish Kunti. I'm a general practitioner and the director for ARC East Midlands. And the reason for hosting this are that we are the national lead for uh, managing, managing multiple long-term conditions among all the ARCs. And these showcases on multiple long-term conditions focus on a wide ranging research programs. We have a number of programs that we've developed uh, with the uh, collaboration with Center for Ethnic Health Research. Um, and you can go to the ARC East Midlands website, uh, the number of events that are uh, running from the 18th of May to June 15th, as well as that we also have uh, annual um, meetings as well, where a number of other ARCs present um, exemplar programs of work that they're doing in multiple long-term conditions. And really, many of these studies feed into the national strategy, which we hope informs practice not only within the East Midlands, but uh, more nationally. And uh, the key uh, projects that do come out with positive results, we hope will change practice within the, the next five years. So with that um, further ado, we will move on to our presentations. So today, we've got three presentations. One is use of real world evidence in multiple long-term conditions by uh, Dr. Claire Gillis from our real world uh, evidence unit. Uh, we've got interventions to address multiple long-term conditions within primary care by uh, Dr. Pat Patrick Hyten, who is from uh, ARC East Midlands. And then uh, we had a call for national multiple long-term conditions implementation program. And we'll take you through um, the project that were uh, supported with that program work by Dr. Ash Barton, and then we will take some questions at the end. So over to you, Claire. Thanks, Kamlish. Right, I'm just going to share my screen and start the PowerPoints. Uh, can you see um, my yes, slides we all right? We, we, we can see them. They're not in um, view. Oh, that's it. Yeah, we can see yeah. them. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to talk about the real, real world evidence and use of big data for understanding multiple long term conditions. Um, as Kami said, I'm based within the Leicester Real World Evidence Unit, and we have uh, ARC funding that supports some of our analysts. And um, it also contributes to some PhD students who uh, we have within our team. Um, so if I just wanted to talk a little bit at the start about what I mean by real world data and real world evidence. Um, so real world uh, evidence is um, results and in information that comes from real world data. And what I mean by real world data is um, data that occurs and happens within the real world. So it's outside the context of um, randomized controlled trials where you have um, a very controlled and artificial environment and it's data that um, occurs um, in, in practice in the real world. Um, so it's sources of real world data um, there's surveillance data that might come from audits or registries. Um, there's routinely collected data that happens um, during day-to-day -day healthcare services. So within our team, we use um, primary hair care databases to look at different health research questions, uh, such as CPRD and THIN. And we also use hospital episode statistics for looking at um, secondary um, um, care outcomes. Um, and then uh, routine uh, data sources can all be linked together. So you can um, answer a question that uses both primary care hospital episode statistics and um, mortality data. And then in addition to these sources, there's um, uh, uh, ongoing cohort studies where people volunteer to uh, be part of the study, such as for UK Biobank, um, which is an ongoing study where people um, volunteer to be part of it and they uh, answer surveys on uh, their, their health, uh, health questionnaires on, um, you know, things like their, their diet and their health activities. 
Um, what I'm mostly going to focus on today, um, obviously within the Leicester Real World Evidence Unit, we work on lots of different projects, um, but this work was carried out by an ARC funded PhD student uh, called Yogini uh, Chudasama, um, and she was supervised by myself, Kamlish and Francesco Sagardi. And she, amongst other questions that she addressed within her PhD, she was looking at um, how healthy lifestyle affects life expectancy in people with or without multiple long-term conditions. Um, now, within her PhD, she used the term multimorbidity, so I'm going to be switching a little bit between the two terms in the presentation. Um, we can see that... Um, Individuals with multiple long-term conditions, it's becoming an increasing problem in the UK in that the number of individuals with multiple long-term conditions is increasing. And you can see here, there's uh, data between uh, 2002 and 2013. And you can see that the number of individuals with two or more long-term conditions uh, has significantly increased. So it was roughly, uh, I guess, about 35% um, in 2002, and now it looks like around 40% of individuals have at least two or more conditions, uh, and this is increasing. So it's an important issue that needs to be addressed in terms of um, how health care is delivered and how we um, give messages around healthy lifestyles to uh, the population. Um, the aim of Yogina's work was to look at the association between individual lifestyle choices and life expectancy. Um, and then she stratified this analysis by people who didn't have multimorbidity or, or multiple long term conditions and people who did. Um, for this, the, the data that she's used for this is. Um, uh, one of the, the surveys that I've mentioned already. So it was the Bi UK Biobank survey. Um, and this is a large, a large study that has over 500,000 participants. Um, recruitment happened between around 2006 and 2010. Um, and at recruitment, the individuals were given a number of questionnaires to answer around their diet, their activity, um, and their general health. Um, and it's been linked to mortality data um, so that we can and look at the long term outcomes in, the, in this cohort. Uh, there's a mean follow up of around seven years. Um, and for the time range we were looking at, there was over 11,000 deaths. Um, so for this study, in the literature, there's lots of different definitions for multiple long term conditions, in particular, what conditions you include in that definition. Um, so what Yogini did as part of her study was to come up with um, her, what she felt was a sensible definition herself. Um, and she looked at the chronic conditions that are included in the, the quality outcome framework. Um, she looked at a systematic review that had looked at long-term conditions um, and a large UK study. Um, and from these, she came up with 36 chronic conditions that she felt needed to be included in her definition. And she defined multiple individuals with multiple long-term conditions as, as any individual, individual, individual who have two or more of these listed conditions. Um, and then in addition, she needed to de define healthy lifestyle factors. So for this, she looked at two, four different variables, uh, which were uh, physical activity, uh, the diet of the individual and how healthy it could be considered, uh, whether they were a smoker or not, and their alcohol consumption. Uh, and what was then done was that a weighted healthy li life, lifestyle score was calculated, combining these four risks factors and then individuals were categorized into one of four groups either very healthy which you can see they probably were um, physically active had a, had a healthy diet didn't smoke and had non or moderate alcohol consumption um, 
or healthy, unhealthy, or very unhealthy. Um, from the results, uh, data was really good. It's often an issue, an issue with real world evidence in that uh, the data might have a lot, lot of missing variables, but that over 480,000 had complete data for the analyses that Yogini wanted to carry out. 95% um, were white, so um, the Biobank UK survey isn't quite representative of the, the UK population. Um, it is dominated by uh, white individuals and um, slightly more females than males. Um, and because of the time span and, and age at recruitment, uh, the median age is 58 years. Um, she found that 19.5% had multiple long-term conditions um, and the most prevalent chronic conditions varied slightly between men and women. Um, so uh, in the top five for women, it, in it included depression and migraine and for men, it included angina and diabetes. Um, and these are the results. And you can see here, um, what we've done is we've looked at uh, mortality rates in the very unhealthy group as the reference population. And then we've compared risk of mortality um, in the three other categories compared to very unhealthy. And we stratified the results by men and women. And at the top, we've got people with multimorbidity. And in this plot below, we've got people without multimorbidity. Um, and I think what's what's interesting here with the results is that uh, the the pattern is very similar across groups so that you can see um, there's a clear trajectory in that the more healthy you are, the lower your risk of mortality is. Um, and this is the same in both men and women and in people with and without uh, multiple long term conditions. Um, and we also considered the results in a slightly different way in that we looked at life expectancy at different ages um, by uh, stratified again by multimorbidity and by um, uh, men and women. Um, so, for example, you can see um, in this first plot in the top left hand corner, you can see at age 45 men with multimorbidity. Um, if they were unhealthy compared to very unhealthy, then you'd expect them to live about one and a half years longer. Um, if they were healthy compared to very unhealthy, you'd expect them to live about four and a half years longer. Um, and then if they were very healthy, their, their life expectancy is just over six years longer compared to very unhealthy. Um, and again, you can see that there's a similar pattern, oops, sorry, similar pattern across people with and without multimorbidity and in men and women. Um, and I think what, what was most important for me was um, as a middle-aged woman without multimorbidity, looking at um, this plot in the corner, I can see that I gain an awful lot from being healthy and um, only a tiny bit more by being very healthy. So. Um, I think um, the emphasis is, is um, maybe on, on being moderately healthy there for me. Um, so in summary, um, from this work, we can see that healthy lifestyle advice uh, should apply equally to patients with and, with and without multiple long-term conditions. Um, so everyone can gain from having a healthy lifestyle and um, the gain in life in, in life years was quite substantial for having a healthy lifestyle compared to being um, very unhealthy. Um, and hopefully this gives you some sort of idea as well of the, the use of uh, real world data for uh, investigating uh, health research questions, um, such as uh, the impact of multiple long term conditions. Uh, so I shall stop sharing. Thanks. Thanks very much for a great presentation, Claire. 
I think that the other thing to say is Yogini did some subsequent work following this, looking at cardiometabolic uh, multimorbidity and depression with Claire uh, as well. And that showed that if you were physically active, you could gain um, anything from four to six years of life at the age of 40 uh, compared to those who weren't uh, physically active with uh, multiple long-term conditions. Um, so thanks, Claire. We, we, we'll take all the questions at the end, if that's OK with everyone. Um, and do please um, put your question on the chat, which I can then ask the panel members. Um, Patrick, uh, you're on next uh, with the presentation. Right. Thanks, Kamlesh. Let me just uh, share my screen. So can you see that OK? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Yeah, yeah we can. Great, that. thank you. So, yeah, today I'm just going to run through um, a couple of the studies that we're working on in uh, in Arches Midlands relating to multiple long-term conditions. Um, and these are these are very pragmatic based studies. As you can imagine, they've been pretty significantly delayed by everything that's happened in the world over the last couple of years. Uh, but but because they are so pragmatic, they're, they're able to be delivered relatively. Uh, in a COVID resilient manner going forwards. Um, and the delay has been mostly due to things like uh, capacity within primary care practices and networks in doing non COVID related research. Uh, so we're very much uh, kind of jumping at the bit to, to, to get these studies going and, and we're finally kind of ready and able to do so. So I'll just give you a very brief overview of these two studies that we're, uh, we're looking at today. Uh, the first of which is looking at text messaging uh, and uh, educational training in statin adherence in primary care or the MedHelp study. And this is being led by Kamlesh and I'm the kind of lead, day-to-day uh, -day lead for the project, I suppose you could, you could say. Um, so the, the problem that we're looking at and addressing for this study is firstly is that um, statin non-adherence or non-adherence to statin medications is very common. Uh, and this can be due to a variety of factors, such as things as simple as forgetfulness or disorganization, but also things like worries about side effects, worries about um, uh, or, or lack of obvious need for the medications in an asymptomatic condition. Uh, but but the, main, the main crux of the issue is that a lot of people, up to 50% of people, don't take their statins as they're prescribed. And this is therefore obviously reducing the clinical benefit of these medications and also causing a lot of wastage um, for healthcare services. Uh, and as you can see here, this, is, this just kind of gives you an idea of the problem uh, and, and how it gets worse time and also is affected by how intense the um, prescription is. Uh, and another issue uh, which, which kind of confounds this problem is that statins are often undersubscribed or suboptimally prescribed. So this can be not being prescribed in those who are at risk and would and would be deemed uh, eligible and advised to take statins or receiving a lower intensity uh, prescription than is recommended. So either less frequent or, or, or lower dosage or quite commonly receiving older versions of statins for patients who have been on them for a long time and, and, and wish to continue despite clinical guidelines suggesting that they may they should be moved to a, a more contemporary version of the drug. Uh, and, and this this these issues basically combine to call to, to create a situation where the statins are not being used as they should. Um, and so we in a large in a, in, in a proportion of cases anyway. And this is uh, what we're hoping to address in the MedHelp study by using a combination of clinician training sessions and also supportive reminder text messages being sent to patients. So in terms of the study design, we will be doing uh, recruiting practices themselves as opposed to individual patients um, from three to four areas in England. Total of 40 practices uh, will be recruited and we'll cluster randomize them 20, 20 to intervention and control groups. Uh, the main criteria we're looking for for practices here is a list size of at least 6,000 patients, which we understand could potentially um, inadvertently discriminate the smaller, more rural practices, but this is something that we need to do in order to be able to have the kind of statistical power that we need for the study and also to make sure that our cluster sizes aren't too, too varied because that makes the analysis very problematic. Uh, and within those practices, the eligibility of the, um, of the patients that we'll be trying to target would 
the those aged 18 to 75, the reason for the upper age cutoff is that that um, patient might be more considered towards de medica medication deintensification, which we'll get onto for the next study. Uh, receiving a statin prescription for at least the last 12 months, they know that their adherence is their kind of true adherence and not novel adherence, having just been received received a new prescription. Uh, and showing clinical signs of statin non-adherence. So true adherence is very difficult to measure directly. So we'll be looking at proxy measures such as elevated LDLC, uh, despite receiving uh, these statin prescriptions. Uh, and also the, the presence of one other long-term condition, because this can really confound or, or, or reduce medication adherence due to things like multiple medications, multiple prescriptions, uh, managing several conditions at once. Um, so anybody with these, these criteria, plus either a form of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or, or high blood pressure would be looking to, to target. So in terms of the intervention, firstly, we will ask for all the practices around the MITE intervention group, we would ask at least two um, GPs or healthcare practitioners from those practices to complete our training sessions, which all which relate to contemporary guidelines around statin prescribing and how to support patients to uh, increase or maintain their adherence to their statin prescriptions. And then also we will send um, eligible patients within these practices um, regular reminder and supportive text messages for a duration of 15 months. And these have been put together based on various behavioral change techniques to try and support statin adherence. And these would be delivered from the practice via the, the kind of routine text messaging systems that are used to send appointments, things like that. The idea being that we can kind of piggyback on this system to make the intervention as pragmatic as possible. Uh, outcome, outcome data would be collected via remote extraction from healthcare records at uh, zero, seven and a half and 15 months. And the primary outcome we'll be looking at is change in low density lipoprotein cholesterol at 15 months with a whole host of other secondary outcomes. So that is the, the, the MedHelp study. So now I'm just going to chat a little bit about a, another, another study that we're completing in primary care uh, at a very similar stage and developmental process to the MedHelp study. And this is Electronic Decision Support System for Deintensifying Medications or DMED. Uh, the lead for this study is Dr. Sam Seydu, and this is being led on a kind of day-to-day -day basis by Dr. Grace Hawthorne. So um, the problem that we're looking to address is that people who live with diabetes and also frailty quite often have very complex medication regimes uh, and this can sometimes result in them being over over prescribed medications so for instance older patients who may not see the real long-term benefits of very tight uh, glycemic control may be better off taking less medication in order to a reduce their overall treatment intensity but b reduce their risk for things like hypoglycemia related falls and things like that um, so, but, but, but due to um, inertia, they might still be receiving the same medications. Be, they might be better off having a review of these medications to see where deintensification can occur. So, the aim of the study is to assess the use of an electronic decision support system to, to basically guide and support clinicians and flag up potential patients for uh, reducing potentially inappropriate medications. This is designed as a kind of guide and support only to allow clinicians to make their, their best, best clinical decision for them, really. Just like that, this will be completed using a pragmatic cluster randomized control trial with intervention and control practices as the clusters delivered in primary care in three to four areas in England. So the study design for DMED, similar to MedHelp, is intervention versus usual care control practices. Again, coincidentally, 40 practices will be um, recruited for this study also, 20 to 20, with a list size of at least 4,000 patients because we expect slightly lower eligible patient numbers compared to MedHelp. Uh, and in terms of patient eligibility, we're looking at over 65 years, greater or, over, greater or equal to 65 years in age, with type 2 diabetes, but with an HbA1c of under 7%. So that those are, you know, patients with relatively well-controlled diabetes who might not need intense anti-diabetic anti medications, but may be seeing increased risk of adverse events as a result of those medications. And also moderate to severe frailty. So we're really talking patients who are at increased risk of falls and, adver and adverse or more serious reactions and, and occur, uh, complications as a result of those falls. 
Uh, the intervention then, similarly to MedHealth, will be asking um, GPs and HCPs, at least two, two per practice in the intervention practices, to attend uh, the intensification webinar around the, the principles of the intensification and who and who and when, who to do it in and when to do it and how you might go about doing this. Uh, and this will be this will be a part of the medication review that eligible patients uh, attend during the study, and the GP can then use this this the, the information gained in this webinar to try and guide them through the the, the concept of the intensification supported by the electronic um, decision support tool. And this will be supplemented by a, a pop up and or search functions as part of this electro electronic tool. So GPs will be able to either search their lists for patients who might be eligible for this sort of procedure or also have a pop-up come up when a patient comes in for an appointment to say this patient may be eligible for medication de-intensification. Uh, similarly, healthcare records will be extracted at 0, 6 and 12 months and the primary outcome will be the proportion of patients who have had potentially inappropriate diabetes medications de-intensified. So that's just a very quick overview of these two studies. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them. But also anything afterwards, please drop us an email either at our study-specific email addresses or uh, our personal ones there below. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks again, Patrick. Um, do you want to just come out of your presentation, please? Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and again, there are some questions coming through uh, and we'll take them all, all at the end. So please do continue putting them in the chat or in the question and answer session. Um, our final presentation is uh, Dr. Ash Larton. He will talk about the National Multiple Long-Term Conditions Implementation Program. Um, as I said, we are the lead for that and uh, um, he'll go through the kind of uh, pro projects that have been chosen through uh, quite a rigorous program. Um, Ash, over to you. Thanks, Kamish. Can you see the slides okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, good afternoon, folks. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, providing a brief overview of the ARC National Multiple Long-Term Conditions Implementation Programme. Um, and I co-led the project selection process for this theme with Professor Richard Baker, who was also based here at the University of Leicester. Um, the theme overall itself is led by Cambridge, who is, of course, the director of Archies Midlands. So for those of you who um, haven't seen um, any information about this or heard me talk about it before, um, the National MLTC, as I'll call it from now on, um, programme was one of seven um, priority research areas across the 15 arcs, which were collectively awarded a total of um, around £13.5 million pounds worth of funding for a three-year uh, programme of work by NHR, uh, sorry, NIHR in autumn of 2020. Uh, and we received just shy of £2 million pounds from that pot. And um, the crux of our programme is um, to try and identify, prioritise and support the implementation of projects that aim to um, really prevent or improve the management of um, people with multiple long term conditions. That's the core aim of the programme. There's a number of other things we would like to do, such as building a national community of um, MLTC researchers providing researcher training opportunities, particularly uh, for early career researchers. Um, and trying to um, think about ways of working with stakeholders and the industry. So um, that's a little bit about the, the programme itself. And to guide the programme, um, we formed a national implementation group. So there are representatives from 12 of the 15 ARCs um, from Research Design Service, HSN, um, AstraZeneca and so on. So they're helping us guide this programme of work. We have a, a wider steering group. To start the programme in earnest, um, we and, and also really to, to meet the core aims of supporting implementation projects and innovations um, at scale, we released a funding call um, to all 15 ARCs in October of 2020, um, which now seems like absolutely eons ago. And essentially what we we're asking for um, were applications that would focus on the implementation, and I stress the implementation here, rather than um, effectiveness, um, of interventions with some sort of evidence potential to, to either reduce the burden of multimorbidity or to improve coordination between health and social care services that you know, deal with multiple long-term conditions. 
and it's really focused on generating learnings um, the learnings needed to be able to scale up projects with potential and so we were seeking interventions that uh, to some extent were ready for wider scale delivery i.e across arcs or um, if there were um, any projects ready to deliver nationally um, even better but the stipulation was the funding um, couldn't be used to uh, undertake implementation itself or to fund the introduction of a new service it was purely for the evaluation of implementation so we said um, that one or more provider must already be delivering the particular service or intervention or have you know uh, a real intention to do so um, for these particular projects so that went out um, in the october of 2020 the funding call um, and we said we could support between one and four projects um, depending on the budget with the maximum award of uh, i think it was five hundred thousand pounds for each ind individual project and what we really wanted to see was ARCs collaborating together. It's an opportunity for ARCs to use their existing resources and infrastructure and pull those with other ARCs to um, deliver um, change at scale. The call closed in early December of 2020, and we received nine applications asking for a total of about three and a half million pounds worth of funding. Um, and then in terms of um, how we selected the projects. I won't go into to all of the details, but we followed something called the, the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative, which is a nice stepwise method for prioritizing and, and selecting um, projects for funding. Um, in short, the applications were distributed to just under 80 reviewers, um, and we had a nice group of um, academics, research design service members, um, clinicians, and a PPI group who reviewed the application. So each one got about five academics, a couple of RDS staff and, and so on, uh, reviewing the projects. And those reviews were completed in January of 2021. And um, the nice thing was that by the end of this process, we could quite clearly rank order the projects um, on a variety of um, scoring systems that, that we, we devised in this process. And there was a clear delineation between the top four um, and the rest of the um, other five projects um, and it was those projects that were selected for funding by the executive implementation group and that was the maximum we could have funded within the available budget were we to have more money then we could have perhaps stretched it to five and they ranged in size of funding bracket from um, 195,000 to um, just shy of 500,000 so that's a little bit about the the process we went through to Try to, to try and prioritize projects for funding um, onto the projects themselves. Um, so the first project aims to study the implementation of uh, an optimized computer template to support personalized care for um, patients with multiple uh, complex multimorbidities in, in primary care. Um, and funding for this was awarded to um, ARC Southwest. And um, as you can see, um, the PI in this case is Professor Chris Salisbury. And there are three other collaborating arcs um, working on this project, and that's West of England, Wessex, um, and West Midlands. And the, um, <clears throat> the premise for this, and actually I've, I've just realized it shouldn't say arc uh, Southwest, that should be arc West for, for Chris Salisbury. The premise of the project is um, that GPs and practice nurses review uh, patients with multiple long-term conditions um, quite regularly using different computer templates or checklists for each individual disease and um, for patients with multiple complex conditions it's perhaps an inefficient and inconvenient way of doing this and it kind of undermines that whole patient perspective um, in general practice and, and recently therefore some practices have combined um, these templates into one annual review using sort of homemade or commercially um, produced templates and um, these all vary in, in quality and type and they tend to as I understand it focus on meeting cough requirements perhaps rather than some of the problems that matter most to patients so Chris and his team um, have a, a devised with Arden's, which I think is the leading supplier, supplier of GP templates um, an optimized template which they have trialed and, and um, tested before and um, it's adapted to try and support more personalized care for, for patients with um, MLTCs. In terms of uh, the progress of the work, they have HRA approval. Um, as of early last month, they've recruited five um, practices 
and um, they are trying to recruit uh, across all of the ARC regions um, involved, which is uh, three other regions. So that's the first one. The, the second project um, of the four focuses on, and again, this is primary care, um, on evaluating the implementation of personalised audit-based education to try and improve the implementation of the nice do not do recommendations for people with um, cardiometabolic MLTCs. And uh, as I said, funding for this went to ARC Oxford and Thames, and it's led by Simon de Lusignan and his team. Uh, and it's collaborating with two other work, uh, two other ARCs. Um, one is our team, Sam Sado and Camlish here at East Midlands, and um, Harm Van Malwikit, uh, Kent, Surrey, and Sussex. And the background to this um, work is really that NICE has identified these NICE, uh, sorry, these do not do targets um, for kind of potential disinvestment. Um, however, I think healthcare, my understanding is that healthcare professionals tend to concentrate more on guidelines of, of what to do and often overlook, often, sorry, overlook perhaps what to discontinue, such as, for example, you know, pre, pre de prescribing certain medications. Um, and so there's, there's a reluctance to adhere to some of these recommendations, um, according to, to Simon's team. Um, and that may be due to competing interests with other clinical roles, lack of time for you know, innovative um, cost-saving ventures and so on. So they've developed and, um, and tested this audit-based education package, which is um, not too burdensome on time. And it includes things like online CPD training, videos, podcasts, and so on, in combination with um, a, a practice dashboard, which will monitor the implementation of the nice do not do recommendations. For example, it might uh, monitor prescribing practices and through an audit process, it feeds that back to um, the healthcare providers in a, in a practice. That's the, that's the premise of their work. Um, they're currently going through university internal ethical approval and they're doing some PPI work and they will be seeking HRA approval. Um, they have contacted practices across the uh, GCP uh, network and it looks like they're doing fairly well at getting expressions of interest from at least three quarters of the um, uh, required sample for that one. So that's, that's project number two. The last two projects I spoke about were primary care based. This next one is both primary care and, uh, and community based. And uh, the aim of this work is to evaluate the, inf impl evaluate the implementation of combining um, two previously efficacious interventions um, that um, have aimed to uh, manage cardiovascular disease risk factors in people with severe mental illness such as bipolar disorder and, and schizophrenia and so on and um, the funding for this was awarded to ARC North Thames and the PI is, is Professor um, David Osborne and uh, the sort of background to this work is that research has shown that people with serious mental illnesses can die between 10 to 20 years earlier um, than expected particularly from cardiovascular disorders um, due to an excess risk of modifiable risk factors um, and uh, primrose um, you or this uclp primrose intervention is a healthcare assistant or nurse-led intervention which combines behavior change techniques and collaborative work um, over, I think, um, flexible appointments with patients over a six month period to try and target things like cholesterol, smoking, weight, blood pressure and so on um, in patients with serious mental illnesses. And um, this has quite a nice um, background to it. I believe there's some well funded NIHR work over the last 10 years on, um, on Primrose and the uh, UCLP programme. And there's a really good strong collaboration um, between York, Arcturum uh, Humber Arc and Arc North Thames um, and in terms of where they are at um, so they've just finished adapting um, some of the intervention materials and, and program materials from previous um, iterations of Primrose and UCLP and in the final stages of having that signed off um, they'll then be submitting to um, NHS research, research ethics um, at the end of this month and then look to uh, start recruiting. So that's, uh, that's project three. Um, and then the final project, um, which is also primary care, um, is another ARC Oxford Thames um, project led by Richard McManus. 
and that aims to study the implementation of the national policy which has been introduced across the NHS on structured medication reviews and try and understand how that might impact care for those with complex multiple multimorbidity and um, say so four plus multiple long-term conditions and the background um, is as I said these structured medication reviews are being implemented across the NHS and it's where a pharmacist or GP will meet with the patient, go through all of the medication and review it in one set in one session. Um, and that sounds quite you know, a good thing to do, fairly logical, but little is known really in terms of how they work and what they might achieve. So Richard and his team are going to uh, dig a little deeper into um, how implementation is going. And um, I think they will take some of the best practice examples and feed that back to practices who perhaps aren't doing so well to try and optimise these um, structured medication reviews and potentially reduce inequalities between practices. Um, we're awaiting a, a progress update on, on that, um, but their, their aim is to recruit 10 practices per arc um, and 70 in total. And I think that you know, this potentially has wide scale impact because it's um, based on national policy. Now, I realise I'm running over a little on time so i'll try and wrap it up quickly we funded for am i okay yeah okay so um we we funded these four studies and um in addition to this we wanted to try and um see if we could generate some common learnings across these four implementation studies so our team at leicester um led by carolyn Tarrant will try and look at each of the projects and focus on generating broader lessons for large scale implementation of interventions to um, optimise care for people with multiple term conditions. And um, that work has received ethical approval data collection from each project team um, has started. And this will be a mixture of secondary analysis, so documentary analysis um, on things like implementation processes and outcomes, as well as some primary data collection, such as uh, interviews and focus groups with, with project leads and some of their project stakeholders. So um, really to conclude, I, I hope um, I've given you an insight to the processes we went through to select the projects, an overview of the projects themselves, um, and finally, how we might be thinking about generating broader learnings from these projects. If you're interested in the national theme or any of the projects, if you go to our Arc East Midlands website and under the research tab, there's um, a tab with national research projects and you'll be able to access lay summaries um, and contact details for each of the five projects that I've spoken about. And uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Ash, thanks very much for another great presentation. Thank you all the, all the speakers today. Um, we are now open for questions. There's a few questions that have come across, so I'll put them over to the panel, and if there are any, do please put them through. Um, one of them came through regarding um, uh, the large data, uh, Claire. Is there any plans for follow-up uh, of these patients uh, using routine data regarding long COVID? Um, yeah, I think... Um... I guess one of the issues with using real world evidence is that you're restricted to um, what's in the data set. Um, and I know UK Biobank at the moment doesn't have a recording on who has long COVID and who doesn't. Um, it's definitely an area we're interested in and um, it's probably something we're more likely to pick, pick up using the, the primary care databases. Yeah, and and you've been funded. Maybe you're being very shy there. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that one. Yeah, so we've we've got some funding from HDR UK. Um, so it's not specifically to look at long COVID, but it's to look at the impact of the pandemic and lockdown on um, long term individuals with long term conditions. Um, so we're going to be using primary care databases to see how um, access to care changed before and after the the pandemic and how this has affected um risk factor control within the individuals thanks very much claire um there's a question patrick earlier on uh regarding ppi input into i think it was the the, the um med help study uh text messaging study um can you take us through what ppi input that study had please 
Yeah, yeah, of course. So we, I noticed in the question as well, there was something about the, the potential reasons for uh, non-adherence. Yeah. So maybe it's better to start there and work back through the PPI. Basically, we um, initially developed the text messages with the support of David French and his team at Manchester, who have a lot of experience in this area. And, and they're designed to address a whole host of reasons uh, for medication non-adherence, not just forgetfulness, you know, things about worries about side effects and, and motivations for, for medications. So whilst conceptually um, uh, a text message might best suit uh, supporting those who simply have uh, organisation problems or forget, there's also the, the content of the messages to, um, to try and drive adherence in patients who might be taking statins for reasons other than, than forgetfulness. Um, and then for the PPI, after that, after that very initial development to make sure we were covering the behavioural change techniques that, that we thought needed to be covered, that went through an iterative process of PPIE kind of refinement and feedback. So they were reviewed several times uh, by, by patients and members of the public to make sure that they were suitable and, and kind of getting the messages across that we wanted them to. Uh, and this, this resulted in us rewording some of the messages, getting rid of some of them if they were perceived to be a little bit negative as opposed to supportive. Um, and another element that we did a lot of PPIE work on is the timing and the frequency of the messages. What we really wanted to avoid doing is annoying people by bombarding them with messages. So we've got a, uh, a text message schedule that starts week, that initially starts a, a, on a weekly basis, one message per week. And then throughout the study, that gets slowly um, slowly reduced down to bi-monthly messages. So yeah, that, that's our kind of text message uh, PPIE development pathway. Thank you. Maybe you could take um, this one as well. There was a, uh, another question there, um, uh, Patrick, about what the patient's thoughts in terms of changing medication. Are there concerns about reducing medications? Did you get that in the PPI at all? Uh, that would have been completed in the PPIE for DMED. Uh, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps yourself as a clinician, Camus, would be a better right. place to answer this yeah. question uh, in terms of reducing medications. Yeah. So, in, in most of the work that's been done in this area, which is very little in terms of randomized control trial, uh, Sam Saidu, who's leading this study, um, did the systematic review on this, and it showed that it didn't do any harm to participants. But obviously, patients are concerned uh, if you are really reducing medications, and that, you know, I see this in clinical practice. A lot of patients think we're doing that to reduce costs. Um, but I, most of the time, if you have a, an open conversation with them, um, that this is uh, the reason we are stopping these medications is that possibly they may not be of benefit now. They may have been many years ago, but not now. And secondly, they may cause uh, adverse events because they're taking other medications. Um, on the whole, um, patients in clinical practice are quite responsive to that. So we haven't had uh, such issues. Um, question there, any work on economic evaluations at all? Um, Claire, are you aware of any, Claire, Claire's a health economist uh, as an epidemiologist. Uh, any, any data on economics there at all? Um, I, I'm not sure if we've costed in to help do health ec uh, economics of the, um, prescribing programs but it's definitely something we could look at um yeah. i think it's it's usually an important part of the intervention evaluation to have some sort of um economic um analysis of the the costs involved so um yeah once we get the results through i think that's something we'll consider exactly in terms of we're not aware of any health economics data for multiple long-term conditions studies not that i'm aware of but all the studies that we've done you know pre in the clock for example if there were positive results we have gone and done health economics evaluation we'll do similarly for for these studies as well um maybe this one's for you ash um although it's as for claire is it's good to get this information into the society in a format that makes sense to the average person are there any actions being taken i mean all the work that we do here we do have a process for it uh, and ash maybe you want to take that one the, the, the process we take through the center yeah certainly well i think we um in the national theme we have um a and this is only just sort of getting going um, in earnest really is uh, a national PPI group to try and um, make sure that we're translating the results of these four to five studies um, into um, 
accessible um, formats for, for, for all populations within the Centre for Ethnic Health Research, which is based at Leicester, because of the, particularly the makeup, ethnic makeup of, um, of the population here in Leicester. We do a lot of work with um, translation of materials into written audio and various different languages. So we'll certainly be applying that to some of our work with multiple long-term conditions. It may be that written format is, is not the most appropriate. For example, when we recruit for studies locally, we might we do things like audio, jingles on the radio that, that sort of stuff so um yeah we'll certainly be thinking about um about that and and then also and this is slightly tangential camish but um just thinking about the question around economic evaluations of the programs within the national theme um one of the seven criteria was affordability cost effectiveness for the funded studies to be judged against and um a number of um the the four selected projects were based on evidence from large trials for example the 3d trial um, has informed chris salisbury's work there and i think they found um cost effectiveness was no uh, uh, no less or more than usual care so there is evidence um of cost effectiveness behind some of the projects we selected for the national theme thanks ash uh, there's a sort of related question regarding inclusivity and diversity being considered in these projects um, yeah, what, how are you um, doing this in terms of the, the couple of the projects that you've mentioned, uh, Patrick and maybe Ash, in the national projects? Yeah, so the, the, the studies are designed because of the way they, they're, they're designed and how pragmatic they are. They're designed to include anyone and everyone who fits the criteria, the eligibility criteria, which are, you know, which are based on the kind of clinical needs. So from that perspective, hopefully we will capture and include everybody who, um, who fits the bill, regardless of, you know, any EDI characteristic that, you, you know, you know, that might impact their participation in the more traditional trial. Uh, with regards to the intervention themselves, so for instance, the MedHelp study, it is a slight limitation that the, the messages are all in English. They're very much lay language so that we can, um, you know, to improve improve understanding of, uh, for, you know, to make sure everybody can understand the messages. But, you know, uh, a limitation is that they're all in English. So, for instance, other ethnicities uh, who struggle with English may have uh, an issue with that. The other slight EDI issue for the MedHelp study is around age and use of, of mobile phones. Um, but because we're not, we're specifically not targeting those over 75 because of the potential greater benefit for de-intensification we're hoping that that will kind of sidestep that issue for the most part um, in terms of uh, the the trial itself what we've done previously in these type of trials is um we don't have exclusion uh, as such except that for the initial trial they have to be english speaking if the trial shows that the results are positive then we've gone and done additional work to make them more inclusive and done that in different languages. For example, the Desmond uh, randomized control trial we did for self-management education programs for diabetes, which is now implemented nationally. Initially, it was done in English, showed positive results. So then we developed it uh, for the South Asian groups and now that's being implemented nationally as well. Ash, do you want to comment on the other projects that you mentioned, the national projects? Yeah, just in terms of the national projects, um, as is now the sort of de facto standard with um, with our internal Arkies Midlands projects, all of the projects um, as a requirement of the funding have to complete an equality impact assessment form, which um, is you know, quite a lengthy process. Um, and it asks the um, investigators to consider both the positive and negative impacts of various facets of their study, for example, that might um, impinge or um, improve the diversity of their research sample, for example, exclusion criteria. And it may be because the research question is quite focused that um, pregnant women, um, for example, are excluded and there would be negative impact on that population. But within the research sample um, that you, you, you're working with, then how can you think about um, trying to um, be as diverse as possible? And, and certainly issues around uh, language and, and of, of templates and so on and those sorts of things will be discussed within the equality impact assessment process. So there might not be much wheel room with some of the projects, but we're trying to work with them to, to improve um, the, uh, the representativeness, um, the diversity of their samples and also opportunities for, yeah, for, for everyone to participate where, where appropriate. Thanks very much. Um, there was a question here regarding 
the patterns of clustering of multiple long-term conditions and their geographical spread and are these and how are these factors uh, in, factored into projects. Um, most of the, the projects that we do, we look at the common uh, multiple long-term conditions and we know there's, there's uh, about uh, 10 of them that um, if we just include those ton, that's, that's over 50% of the multiple long-term conditions. We're trying to work in those areas for now rather than uh, some of the rare ones. And we know that all of those uh, conditions are prevalent across uh, the board. Um, the, the only criteria we're using is to make sure that we include ethnic minority populations and uh, deprived populations. So when we pack the, pick the practices, we, that's the two things that we are considering in our trials. Um, there's a, a comment here. Thank you. It seems to me that perhaps there's a space to create accessible social media content that could impact the society quickly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we try and disseminate as much as possible, um, but uh, I don't, I'm not aware of anywhere that the social media content is accessible from one point. Uh, and I'm not sure if anyone else in the, in the group is here or uh, e even in the panel uh, uh, um, and the delegates who have joined, uh, I'm not aware of anything that's national nationally available for everyone in an accessible format. Mm, no. I think we've covered uh, all the questions that come through. Uh, I think in view of the time, um, we, we're right on time. So again, thank you very much for all the presentations and keep you to time. It's quite exciting that, you know, 10 years ago or so, NICE came up with uh, the guidelines on multiple long-term conditions, mainly epidemiological studies, very few interventional studies, and now we're seeing uh, primary research on interventional studies and also implementation research on implementation studies. Um, so it's quite an exciting area that we, we, you know, nationally we are developing program of work which will help um, this uh, population that's aging population. And as we all know, multiple long-term conditions will become more prevalent over time. So we await the results of these trials. And finally, just to say that there are other uh, uh, seminars we are doing. Um, the, the, the one that may be of interest is uh, for many people is the lived experiences of multiple long term conditions. So Pauline Mountain, our community voices uh, panel member will be talking about this. This is on the 18th of May. There's a uh, managing multiple long term conditions, uh, three presentations on the 1st of June. And we've got Claire featuring again, Claire, on the 15th of June on real world data and future directions. So please do join us for those. Uh, otherwise, thank you all very much for joining and uh, have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. That's a quick plug for a Delphi survey. If anyone's uh, interested, please do um, join that Delphi survey. <laughs>